I'm Kokuma, and I will give a presentation on the idea and current status of the authentication infrastructure and future initiatives of Medical Group. Let me introduce myself first. Since I joined Melpay's IDP team around 2019, I've been working on certification and authentication. So it has been only been a few years since I started working in this field, but I found it quite interesting, and I would like to work in this field for the next 10 years or so. As the basic role of the IDB team, we are responsible for the certification and authentication of Mercari uh, accounts and the management of the tokens related to the, these. And the goal of an objective of this team is to implement appropriate authentication, access control, and data protection for the Mercari group services in a standard manner. So I would like to explain this briefly. First, what situations do we consider appropriate for authentication, access control, and data protection? Firstly, as for authentication, we believe that appropriate is to be able to provide a strong enough authentication to meet the needs. In particular, the level of authentication strength required for this particular service will basically depend on what this service offers. For users, authentication itself is not the purpose of using the service. So if it is sufficient, then they do not want to do it as much as possible. Therefore, from the product side, we want to use authentication that is strong enough for our service. Therefore, we consider appropriate authentication to be authentication that is strong enough to be necessary. Next, regarding access control, this simply aims to create a situation where the principle of least privilege can be applied. This is not only to avoid granting unnecessary privileges, but also to allow settings the appropriate level of granularity of privileges. For example, if the granularity is too rough, it may grant privileges that are not necessary, and if the granularity is too fine, it may be difficult for the client or end user to use the use and understand. So this is the area to consider in the appropriate access control. As for the last part of data protection, this is based on the reference that have recently came out. So I feel that I have not yet been able to delve into it, but basically I believe it is to minimize data and to realize data's unlinkability. For example, if there are multiple companies within the same group, each of which stores personal information, we believe that the data unlinkability is something that prevents the information from being easily linked to each other. These functions are fundamental and are basically used by all services, so versatility is quite important. So there are something that is provided to a specific team, project, or a specific use case. The basic stance by DP is to make them as generic as possible so that they can be used by any team or project. On the other hand, these functions can be a single point of failure in security. When creating these functions, our basic stance is to follow the standard specifications as much as possible rather than to come up, come up with the specifications from scratch and think of attack cases and countermeasures on our own. The specific positioning of these functions related to certification and authentication will basically depend on the types of client. Currently, we believe that Merukari's clients can be roughly divided into three categories, first blood party client, relying party, and resource server. The first party client is a client provided by Merukari MailPay directly, and basically all functions of Merukari MailPay can be used through the client. Relying Relying party is used when you want to create a new service using some of the features of Merukari MailPay. That last one, resource server, 
has the same purpose as relying party, where you want to create a new service using some of Mercury's functions. Then you want to offer the functions as part of the Mercury MerPay and also set up clear boundaries with Mercury MerPay, both in terms of security and data governance. Depending on which clients and components are targeted, how exactly to achieve appropriate authentication and access control will vary. What we have to do in IDP is to be aware of those differences, but ideally to provide functionality in a standard, standardized form as much as possible. In this presentation, I'd like to talk about authentication of first-party clients and access control to relying party and resource server and data protection. Firstly, let me talk about the authentication of the first party client. This is about authentication in the first party client provided by Merukari Merupay itself. In discussing this, I would first like to talk about what is going on. Currently, Merukari supports four types of authentication factors, password authentication, phone number or so-called SMS authentication, and passcode authentication, and SNS login authentication. Users can use them to log in their Merukari account or use other functions with additional authentication. What we call additional authentication here is to perform authentication again before the user do some critical operation. This is to mitigate effects of device theft or account theft. For example, perform SMS authentication before changing the email, and once it is done, the email change is completed. Currently, this additional authentication supports two types of authentication, passcode and SMS authentication. In particular, SMS authentication was introduced as one of the countermeasures against the considerable increase in phishing attacks around June last year. Thanks to this, phishing is now much less of a problem. However, there are still quite a few issues left. One of the challenges is the user experience. In response to phishing attacks, many functions now require SMS authentication. Attacker, attackers obtain a password or SMS code from a phishing site log into the account and try to use some functions. This is the attacker's way. By using SMS authentication as an additional authentication, the attacker would have to obtain the SMS code again to use the function, even after the account has been hijacked in that way. It is quite difficult to get the SMS code over and over on the same phishing site. Even if an attacker hijacked an account, the attacker cannot use the function, so the motivation to hijack the account is eliminated and the attack is prevented as a result. On the other hand, this means that legitimate users also have to be authenticated by SMS for various functions, resulting in deteriorated user experience, which challenges us. Another challenge is the issue of authentication strength. Currently, supported authentication factors such as password and SMS authentication are basically not phishing resistant. In other words, it is possible that an attacker may steal authentication information like password and SMS code via phishing sites. Current countermeasures rely on the fact that it is difficult to obtain credentials again and again on the phishing site. In the future, when the forms and patterns of these attacks change, it is very doubtful we will be able to rely on the same things to prevent attacks. 
So the fact that we have not been able to implement phishing-resistant authentication factors is a major issue at present. This is the current status and challenges of authentication for first-party party clients. As for what we would like to do in the future, first of all, we would like to promote the introduction of FIDO as a strong authentication factor that is resistant to phishing. The first favorable feature of FIDO is, of course, it is a phishing-resistant authentication factor. The basic flow of FIDO is that the user firstly owns a FIDO authenticator and the private key managed in the authenticator is used for authentication. Specifically, the public key corresponding to the private key managed in the FIDO authenticator must be registered on the server side in advance. For the authentication values, various information is collected, signed, and sent to a server which verifies the signature and identifies the further. User. Among the various information contained in this signature, information such as which domain or which website, website performs authentication is included, which can then be verified by the server side. Even if a phishing site asks for FIDO authentication and the user answers and the attacker gets an uh, assertion, when it is sent to Mary Curry, we can verify which site the FIDO authentication was performed on. So, this is authentication method. This authentication method is said to be phishing resistant. Another desirable feature is that it is user-friendly authentication factor. A common usage is for the user to authenticate locally using Touch ID or Face ID, and then the FIDO authentication FIDO authenticator accesses the private key and authenticates with that private key. It is a user-friendly authentication because you do not have to enter a long password or wait for an SMS code to arrive. The fact that this is standardized will also be a key for users to easily use the system in the future. However, on the other hand, Private key management will impose a fair, large burden on users. For example, if a user loses their FIDO authenticator, they will not be able to log in or use certain functions with additional authentication anymore. The most common case we expect is using a smartphone as a platform authenticator. We believe that it can be a common case for users to lose their FIDO authenticator when they change their handset model and throw it away, throw away their old handset. The common and recommended way to deal with this is to register multiple FIDO authentication authenticators in advance. So even if one is lost, there are other ones to take care of it. But basically, average users do not have security keys. And I think that very few users have multiple smartphones or PCs compared to the total number of users. So you will need to go through the process of re-registering the key on the new device before changing and discarding the old one. If you fail to do so, the FIDO authenticator will be lost. So you must have some means of recovery, such as contacting the UCS to verify your identity. But this kind of operation is basically not something that current users, especially Mercury users, are accustomed to because it has not been done before. So I think it, it would be a quite burden on for users. But if you try to mitigate the load and make the recovery process easier, you now have a security concern. For example, if a second FIDO authenticator can be easily registered when the first 
Fido Authentica is lost, such as adding it via SMS authentication, then as a user, you can recover the Fido Authenticator without having to contact the CS. So the UX is better. That would, on the other hand, open up the possibility that an attacker could register your, your FIDO authenticator so that when he, ja he hijacked your account, he would be able to register your FIDO authenticator. In this situation, although FIDO authentication itself is phishing resistant, the registration and recovery process can be attacked and the phishing resistance of FIDO cannot be fully utilized. So in the current situation, I believe that the burden of key management has to go to the user. Still, we would like to use FIDO's phishing resistant features in the future. If passkey or something alike becomes generally available in the future, I'm sure the way these things are handled will also change. So basically, we would like to introduce this FIDO and gradually apply it to login and additional authentication. In addition to the introduction of FIDO, we would also like to implement flexible additional authentication that is suited to each product. If FIDO can be used for additional authentication, how can it be combined with existing SMS authentication and passcode-based additional authentication? Such topics come up. The basic stance is that it depends on the product. For example, if a product requires strong security, we may decide to only allow additional authentication with FIDO. Well, there may be products where SMS authentication is sufficient for security, but we may want to use FIDO to improve user experience. If the user is able to use FIDO, we will allow them to use the function with FIDO authentication, but if they're not able to use FIDO, they can use SMS authentication. Therefore, the functionality provided by IDP needs to be able to be used in any pattern. Another thing, if the user is FIDO authenticated and the possibility of phishing is considered to be low, we want to allow authentication factors used for login or for other functions to be used as a reference for the functionality that the user is currently trying to use. For example, if the user used FIDO authentication at login, the authentication could be skipped for the function they are currently trying to use. We would like to create and introduce a mechanism that allows us to change whether or not to use additional authentication or what authentication factor to use depending on the context after the login. So this was about first party authentication. Next, I would like to talk about access control and data protection for relying parties. This is when a third party service creates a new service using the functionality for Mercari or MailPay. And I said third party for the sake of convenience, but services within the Mercari group can also create new services using this method. For relying parties, the process of authentication and obtaining access tokens is basically in line with OAuth and OIDC. It's not really interesting to explain this process. So here, I would like to explain how access restrictions and data protect protection are considered on the server side after the access token has been obtained. In order to explain the current status, 
I would like to describe the situation inside the Mercari and Merpay servers and how requests flow between services. Currently, Mercari and Melpay are basically configured with a microservice architecture. So the servers are full of microservices. Each microservice has its own API, which it provides to other microservices. However, the API is not directly referenced by the client application, but is, but, is, but is accessed via the API gateway in the middle. In this API gateway, protocol conversion, access token verification, and access control are performed. In such circumstances, when you want to create a new service using the functionalities of Mercari and Merpay, what happens is that you have to create a new API gateway dedicated to a specific client. So in the diagram here, if client X comes up, an API gateway for X is created. The API gateway for X creates a route only to the microservice that has the functionality that client X wants to use. So basically, this API gateway for X only wants to be used by client X. So how to restrict it is to prepare a scope with a name like client X, put it in the access token, and if the access token has that scope, it can go through the API gateway. There are many challenges with this approach. For example, every time a new service is created, a new API gateway needs to be created, which is additional cost, and the management cost increases rapidly. Furthermore, the cost will, of course, affect the development speed of the client. Secondly, the granularity of access restrictions being too coarse is also a problem. If the API gateway were to be unified and an unspecified number of clients were to be allowed to use the gateway, in the current state, the only restriction is whether or not the gateway can be accessed. And there is no granular control of what functions are can be used via the gateway. If the API is standardized, clients will be able to use functionalities that they do not need to use. So these are the issues. Furthermore, there are several problems in the context of data protection. One is the interface issue. Currently, the interface of a microservice is used directly by the client through an API gateway. However, the API provided by the microservice is basically designed to be used by other microservices within the same company, and the use of APIs by external services is not intended. Therefore, for example, the microservice interface does not provide restrictions on who can access what resources or what, what personnel information. Therefore, as an external API, it is not possible to provide sufficient access control or restrict resources. There's also a problem with user IDs. Basically, when a client obtains an access token or ID token, it follows the OIDC process. 
That's why it's not necessary to obtain the user ID used inside the server. Therefore, it is basically possible for the IDP to issue a PPID in OIDC and for the client to identify the user with this PPID. However, since the published API is the same as the interface on the microservice side, some interfaces specify the user ID as one of the parameters of the request. Therefore, in order to use the API, the client needs to know the raw user ID inside the server. And since it is not possible to use the API with the PPID, this client X and Y will also use the same user ID as the server. When this happens, The original purpose of PPID, that is to prevent RP tracking, will no longer be possible. Furthermore, it makes it easy to link personal information stored in different organizations. I believe each organization stores personal information based on user IDs and have access controls in place to access that information. If personal information is leaked from one organization, and if a user has access rights to both organization, and if information from each organization is stored using the same user ID, the information from each organization could be tied together and cause more damage than expected by the respective companies. Although the basic policy is that the authority to access each organization's data and the authority to link their data as the same person's data are basically considered to be two different authorities. If both, but if both organizations use the same, or use, same user ID, the separation will not be possible. This is the current situation and issues of access restrictions and data protection regarding relying parties. To resolve this situation, what we want to do going forward is to first offer a common API. This API is basically to be provided as an API that can be used by an unspecified number of RPs. It will be something that fulfills what we have to be aware of as externally facing API. So the first thing you need to be aware of as an externally facing API is that you can restrict the available API gateway and API. Although we say common API here, this does not negate the fact that you can provide an API for a specific client. For example, we believe that it is more appropriate to create an API used by first party clients that is specified to their first party use case rather than a generic API. Therefore, we believe that the basic structure is that there are multiple API gateways. Therefore, it is necessary to to appropriately restrict which gateways can be accessed by the access token paid out to client X. In addition, as a single API gateway will be used by an unspecified number of clients, it will be necessary to limit the access by functionality. It is necessary to control permissions so that only the functions required by the client can be used. Of course, IDP alone cannot create such a common API. It is necessary to discuss with the architects of each company and the product teams that provide the APIs and to consider what form or approach would best match the current situation and future vision of Mercari Group. We will then consider the functionalities we need to provide as IDP. For example, we need to think about how to limit the available API gateways and how to limit resources. 
In the case of gateway API restrictions, it is common to control the authorization of these access tokens by means of claims within the tokens. How can we do that? The question of what granularity and scope of authorization control is basically an implementation issue and is outside the scope of the standard specification. Currently, we use audience to request restrict gateways and try to restrict which API can be used by using scopes. Which API is available according to scope is basically something that the team that publishes the API can control by themselves. By doing this, we believe we will be able to maintain consistency in the granularity and format of the scopes and what they represent. For this reason, we do not intend to create any kind of company-wide scope system at the moment. We are thinking of trying to define the scopes in a way that is closed to the API gateway. This was all about access control and data protection pertaining to the relying party. Summary. So this is the current state of topics related to IDP, although I have spoken about them in a very short and shallow, broad and shallow manner. I hope to be able to explain this uh, in more depth about each of these topics in the future once they become more concrete. Thank you very much for your attention.